Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll read the entire chapter for a text tonight. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, if ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or ex extortioners are with idolaters, for then you must need go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. In verse number 6, he said, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just a little bit of leaven will mess up the whole lump. I want to preach tonight on adult, the crack in the dam. The crack in the dam is similar to what Paul is speaking of in verse number 6 when he said the little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It's not the big rush of water that tears a dam apart and floods the city. It's a little bitty crack that's in that dam that through a a series of time it begins to eat away at that crack and it begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The city or the state that's overseeing the dam where the river is that protecting the town from being flooded. They don't wait if they're wise. They don't wait until there's a big breach in that dam. When they know that there's a crack there, then they begin to take means to mend or fix that crack that it does not become a danger to the city. What we have here is what the Corinthians deem as just a small thing. And you'd wonder tonight, why do they think it's just a small thing? It's reported. And everybody knows that this man has been with his father's wife, his stepmother. This is not a small thing. But obviously, they're looking at it as a small thing. They're just puffed up with pride and arrogance as though that it's just one uh, isolated case. It's not all over the church. Why get excited about it? It's just a small thing. And Paul began to realize 
When he heard the report, this small thing, huh, if it's not dealt with, will become a big thing. If it's not dealt with, it will become a giant. If it's not dealt with, it will destroy the entire city of believers. This little crack in the down huh, is a danger to many lives within the body of Christ. And Paul begins to deal with it as such. We'll look at the text again and go on further to what I feel like the Lord would have us to go parallel with this in the modern day we're living in. He said this is something that's not even named among the Gentiles or in his case the heathens that were really new to the gospel. They didn't know. He said these people that don't know any better, it ain't even named among them. And you're puffed up. You're, in other words, you're not excited. You're not tore up. You're not, you're not uh, weeping that this is going on. You're not, you're not mourning. What is your problem? He said, I'm not even there. And I'm not even there to sense the spirit of this horrendous sin in the church. And I've already made a judgment call. I've already decided what needs to be done here. You see, a spiritual discerning individual hears about something in the body of Christ. They already know it's a stench in the nostrils of God. And these individuals are sitting there and pretending it's not going on. But if you live at the, in the valley and there's a big lake above the valley on the mountain there and there's a great body of water behind that dam and you see that there's a crack in that dam you're going to start getting nervous or you're going to be plain ignorant. Because you know after a while that thing's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this has happened time and again in the church of our hour. A little thing happens and it doesn't seem to be dealt with. It doesn't seem to be pinpointed. It doesn't seem to be preached against. And so therefore those that are not spiritually discerning begin to think, well maybe this is alright and it won't be such a bad thing for us after a while. He said, in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that, in the, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He said, go ahead and tell this man, you don't belong in this body of believers. You are a hypocrite. You don't belong here. And we're going to deliver you and put you in the category where you really belong. And that category is with the lost. That category is with the sinners. So that when the Spirit of Christ comes by, He'll recognize I've got sin in my life and I can repent. You don't tell a man's wrong. He never knows he's got to get right. I said, if you never tell a man that he's wrong, he never knows he's got to get right. So he said, put him in the category where he belongs. What we see in this narrative, in this letter, is the hard reality that everybody in the church is not saved. Everybody that sends a testimony forth is not truly born again. He said it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. This was the body of believers. This was the Christian community in the church at Corinth. And somebody in that body that clapped their hands, that sung the songs, that may have done some kind of function in the body of Christ, was doing a horrendous sin and the church was pretending it wasn't going on. You know why we pretend it's not going on sometimes? Because it's my little granddaughter or it's my 
little grandson or it's my brother or my sister or my cousin or it's the good tithe payer or it's somebody of great standards uh, stands among the people and we just do not want to rock the boat and upset anybody in the church. But Paul is saying it's coming a time you're going to have to do what you have to do that this crack don't turn into a big breach and the whole thing gets flooded with the world or with ungodliness. He said, this ain't good. A little leaven. Leaven. The whole lump, just a little bit of leaven will make that thing swell up. You cooks, you know what I'm talking about. Just a little bit of, what do you call it in modern terms? A little bit of yeast, just a pinch of yeast will make that bread just whoop, swell up out of that thing. Just a little bit of sin. Just a little bit. Don't have to be a horrendous large thing. Just a little bit will affect the whole lot. How do you know that, preacher? I've been around for a little while and I've seen the whole lump, what it looks like now as a whole. And I tell you, I remember we'll begin to see the little leaven as it started coming into the law. He said, purge out. Here is the second time he makes mention here of doing something about it. The first time is in verse number 5. Uh, put him in his place. Put him in with the sinners. Classify him exactly where he is. Don't give him a Sunday school class. Don't make him an usher. Don't put him on the deacon board. Uh, don't ask him to lead in prayer. Put him where he belongs. Now in verse number 8, uh, or verse number 7, he says, Purge out. Purge means to clean. Purge needs to make whole. Purge out therefore that old leaven. Get that out of here because Christ, He was sacrificed for us that we would find purity, that we would find holiness, that we would find righteousness. Christ is the reason that the body of Christ must be pure and sin coming in to the body of Christ must be dealt with. Sin coming in. Daddy, you're the priest of that household. Sin coming into your house. You're responsible as the priest of that household to deal with that and to see that it doesn't come into that house and how resonance among your children and among that household. Sir, if you're a child of God tonight, your house should be a holy house. It should be a place where you bring your family around an altar and you bring them to prayer and the sweet essence of the presence of the Holy Ghost will be simply known and reflected in that house. But you back up and be a yellow back. Amen. And let those children bring things in. And let that wife bring things in that are displeasing to God. You're letting a little leaven. And it's going to mess up the whole thing after a while. And a flood of sin is going to overcome that household. Therefore, let us keep the feet. Let us worship God. Not with the old leaven, not with that that's from Adam's mentality of disobeying God. But let us keep it neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Unleavened bread. Of sincerity and truth. Now I wrote to you, don't keep company with fornicators. You understand what fornicators are? Their relationship out of marriage. Which, and, and Israel was called a fornicating nation many times because their 
love and their passions went outside of their marriage vow unto God. And Israel was blessed with the mercy of God for the Word of God tells us that God's married to the backslider. And if you're backslid on God tonight, there's hope for you. Yes, You've been fornicating in the spiritual realm, uh, running with this world, uh, and laying with the ungodliness of this world. Uh, but God said, I still love you. Uh, I'm still waiting uh, like the prodigal son's daddy was. Uh, I'm still standing on the porch, uh, and I'm waiting. When's my son? When's my daughter? When's my child going to come back home? Paul's and I told you not to keep company with fornicators, but wait a minute, not 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 altogether fornicators of this world are the covetous or the extortioners or the idolaters. For but then you, you're gonna have to take a spaceship and and zoom on out of here because they're everywhere. But he said he narrowed it down now not to keep company of any man that is called a brother. And that's what they're dealing with here is a man who is calling himself a brother and he's sleeping with his stepmom. That's horrible. It's just as horrible in any other fashion or kindred you look at it. He said, don't keep coming. If any man be a fornicator, he calls himself a brother. If he's a fornicator, covetous, cannot have enough of everything he can get his hands on. That's just as bad as a fornicator. Yes, Covetous or an idolater or a railer or somebody that just is going to rail and spew and spout and quad and fuss all the time. Yes. He, say, he says he's a brother. Don't even keep company with him. Yes. That's right. Oh, thank the Lord for his good presence tonight. No, with such a one, no, not to eat. What have I to do to judge them that are without? I I don't judge them that are without, but do not ye judge them that are within. The body of Christ is given this responsibility to conduct discipline in the house of God. Don't puff up at your pastors he decides to set you down if you're not living right and you're working in an office in the church. I said, don't you dare get puffed up at your leader when he begins to start setting people down. and no, you're not going to teach. You're not going to sing. You're not going to do this till you get this settled in your life. This is his responsibility as an under-shepherd to the great shepherd Jesus Christ to keep that leaven out of the body of Christ. But them that are without God will take care of them. Oh, that sinner crowd, you can talk about them, but God's going to judge them. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. What he said was, go to the down. Get you some mortar. Get you some tools. And start patching that crack in the dam up. You crack, you, you, you patch that crack in the dam up by getting real rid of the reason that it was there. You don't just patch it up, but you remove whatever caused that. What would cause a crack? A foundational problem. Deal with it. And fix it. You see, the church here in Corinth was at risk. And Paul said, we're going to have to do something to stop this risk. We're going to have to do something before it is destroyed. The church in our day is at risk. The closer we get to the Lord's return, the greater the risk is. Because Satan is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It is a fact tonight that he knows his days are numbered 
And he's working with more fierceness and anxiety than he's ever worked before. How many of you could testify tonight and say, Brother Morgan, it's harder to really get a hold of God than it was some years ago. You that's been saved a while, it's just a pressing hour that we're in. It's a pressing in there. Why? Because the enemy's pressing. And therefore, we have to press against him. The church is at risk. And worldliness doesn't come in big quantities, but it comes in small ways. Great denominations of our day that have fallen into worldliness did not fall overnight. They did not fall because of great big things, but it started with just a little bit of leaven that was winked at and looked through their fingers and pretended it didn't happen, but it did happen. And after a while, they turned into a nominal looking Pentecostal church that has an emotion and a stirring but does not have a genuine move of the power of God. This is what the Lord gave me, brother. There are cracks in the dam. Tonight, there's a cracks in the dam. The cracks could be called tonight a crack of arrogance and pride that have crept in among The people of God. The arrogancy and the pride that I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I'm big enough. I'm old enough. I've read the Bible enough. I don't need Him to tell me what the Bible says. I'm quite educated enough within myself. That's a crack in the dam. Humility is, humility will be, and it always has been the crowning virtue of Christianity. The humble heart will be the heart that God blesses. The haughty, prideful, arrogant heart will be the one that God brings down. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 13, there is a generation... I believe that we're living in that generation. Oh, how lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids are lifted up. It's a crack in the dam. And it's destroying the church if it's not taken out. You see, these things that are destroying the church are spiritual things. And it's the spirits that we're dealing with. And we invite these spirits to get bigger and stronger when we do not deal with these spirits. And personally, we need to deal with these spirits. It's one thing for the pastor or the preacher to deal with it from the pulpit in our lives, but then we've got to deal with it. I've been marked. I understand. I see that that's in my life. I recognize. I've been arrogant. I've been prideful. Amen. I've not been humble in the sight of God. God, I've got to deal with this. The pastor's not going to be able to shake it out of you. You're going to have to get in an altar and pray through and get delivered from that spirit that is a crack in the dam in your life. Because if it's not dealt with, it will bring a breach in that water a hole in that wall and that flood is going to come in and more things than not is going to overcome you in your life. Another crack in the dam is a disrespect for seasoned wisdom and leadership. Seasoned wisdom. What happened to the day when young preachers would lean upon the advice of the older man of God. What happened to the day when they would cherish those moments just to sit at the foot of a seasoned man and listen to that wisdom but oh, we, we, we don't need that now. We, we know enough. We can agree or disagree with what the old preacher man said. But the Bible didn't present that to us that way. The Bible presented to us in the book of of Leviticus, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, meaning the white head, the old man, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God. And God said, I am the Lord. It's as though He said that. He said to rise up before Him. 
rise up before Him, honor His face, fear thy God. Listen, buddy, I'm the Lord that just told you that. Rise up means respect. Rise up means that if the old man comes to you and you're sitting there in your pew, you rise up to shake his hand. In respect. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm not old enough to... to <laughs> watch out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Rise up before the hoary head in respect. Uh, there's a crack in the dam. And there is a abundance of wisdom among the older men of God that are slowly... And I don't put myself in that category. I'm yet a young man. I mean, at, 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 at 16 years old, I thought a 30-something-year-old was ancient. And in my 20s, the 40s were ancient. In my 30s, the 50s were ancient. But in my 50s, the 60s are yet young. Shout <laughs> on, amen, old men. But he said, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. A crack in the wall when there's disrespect for the seasoned wisdom and leadership of the older generation. Young folks don't want to hear this. They don't want to read. Some of them don't. Well, Rev. Boehm had a decision to make. And those guys come to him and they said, uh, uh, make it easy on us. We'll be your servant. He asked the, young, the old men, said, what should I do with these people? With Jeroboam and all his crown, the old men said, be nice to them and they'll eat out of your hand. What more can a king have in a, in a, in a, in a generation where fighting is the main occupation of everybody around there? I mean, it seemed like in the Bible that's all they'd done. I don't know how they grew crops. It's fighting all the time. I mean, they didn't have shirt factories. They didn't have uh, all this. They just fall, fall, fall. And sometimes we do it in the church, don't we? But that'd be a, a beautiful thing to have them just eat out of your hand. Snap your fingers and they're going to run here, run there, do whatever you want them to do. That's a pretty good deal. But for some reason, real bull didn't really think that was all there was to advise. So he called on his buddies that know where it's at. We all together in this thing, boys, we come up together. We know where it's happening at. Come on, young folks, shout amen. You know it's exactly right. Because I used to be one. That's how we thought. An old man don't know nothing. You tell me what to do. Oh, they, they said, man, you tell him you're going to, you, you be the big boy. You be the big man. You tell him you're going to make it tougher than they've ever dreamed of in their life. Scare them out of their hide, man. You present yourself as the big dog. He did. And he wakes up the next morning with two out of twelve tribes following him. He looks up in the next morning and he sees a flood of regret and a flood of defeat and a flood of sorrow and a flood of all kind of things that he wouldn't have had to deal with if he had not had that spirit of rejecting and disrespect for leadership. The older leadership in God. There's great men among the holiness preachers tonight, older men, Brother Rich, Brother Neil Bridges, Brother Brother Addis, and so on. But if our younger generation don't stop and begin to listen to these men, there's things that I'd like to say and I'd like to present to people, but I don't have the voice they've got. And you'd think they'd listen to them, but we've got a generation that's coming on that we don't want to hear the old man. They don't realize there's a crack in the wall. 
there's a crack in the wall and the flood's fixing to come. Your children, your grandchildren's going to be affected by the crack in the wall. The flood's going to affect them more than it's affecting us. We need to pray that these spirits will be overcome by the only thing that can overcome them. And that is the Spirit of God and a move of the Holy Ghost. Not just a move that makes us move, but a move that moves us into truth. Another crack in the dam is personal gratification in the name of worship. There's no sweeter experience tonight than to come to God's house and to find it as Jesus told the woman at the well. He said, the hour is coming and even is now when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That has nothing to do with my flesh. That has nothing to do with what makes me feel good. That has nothing to do with what makes me pat my foot. It has nothing to do with what I like or dislike. It has all to do with worshiping Him in a spirit of honor, in a spirit of praise, in a spirit of glorifying Him in the truth that He is the way, the truth, and the life. It is worship in its purest form that has no fleshly gratification involved in it. When we come to the point that we say we don't want amazing grace because it's too slow and I can't worship with it because it's too slow, your worship is for the flesh and it's not for the Spirit. You've got a crack in your dam. It's going to destroy you after a while because your spiritual man does not receive from your worship. Only your emotional man receives from that. Paul told the Ephesians, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When we sung tonight, he abides. He abides. Hallelujah. He abides. That's reaching down in my soul. For I know who He is. And I know He abides. I know He's alive in my life. I know I've been saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost baptized. I know it. It affects this natural man. It affects this body. But I didn't sing it to get it affected. I sung it to worship Him, making melody in my heart unto Him. Every time we sing or play to produce a move, instead of worship, there's a crack in the wall. He said to the Colossians, let the Word of God, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalm and hymns and spiritual song, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Twice Paul mentions to us the, the act of worship in song. Both times there, he calls us to the words of Jesus. It's a heart thing. It's a heart thing. When it becomes a gratification of self, or gratification of feelings, or even emotions. It's no longer a heart thing. By this fact, though, we are emotional beings. It'll affect us. We shout, we run. But it starts in the heart. It doesn't start with a... And it starts. In the heart. And if I can't get a hold of His presence without the bump bumps and the bebop, there's a crack in my wall. Hallelujah. My Lord, I have knelt Brother Butler sometimes in such a quiet place. 
And oh God. Heaven. Come down in the room. And then I begin to get a paw on my knees. And my wife said she's praying the other day and she started singing. She said, well, I guess that's what the Bible talks about in a personal devotion. Wow. And what song was she singing? Huh? Oh, how I love Jesus. I must have been out in the yard somewhere. I didn't hear her singing. Praise the Lord. But oh, how I love Jesus. Heaven is real. But I can let a crack get in the dam. And all of a sudden, all I've got is the stir and not a move of God. I went to a church in 1998, I believe it was. I've been to several since then. But this particular one I remember well. I was there. I didn't really want to be there, but I was there anyway. I was uh, a, a, a local pastor and and it was organizational type thing, and so I thought it'd be nice to visit the other church in the community having revival, and they were jumping a good bit. And they was jumping for the Lord, jumping, leaping for joy, I guess. But I just couldn't, I just couldn't get that jump in me like they had. So I just kind of stood there and sat there and wondered and prayed and sought the Lord and, and wondered why am I here and what would be a good? How could I get out of here without causing a lot of attention? Y'all don't get quiet on me right here. <laughs> then they got to singing and jumping more, and then they got to running around. I've run in the spirit. Now don't ask me to run without him. I've sung a song in the spirit that I can't sing out of the spirit. My wife will tell you. I mean, I can't reach those highs. But one night in the prison, it was just ooh, it was just a coming out, and, I, and I'm thinking it. it, it this mouth coming out of these vocal cords. Thank you, Lord. It was happening. But later on, I asked a young man that was there that I knew didn't quite agree with the, the mentality of the, the liberalism that was going on there besides the, the manifestations. It's just the lifestyle that was mingled in with all of that too. But that's, that, that's to be expected by the worldly crowd. We shouldn't expect to find it among the Holiness people. Huh? I mean, you can expect some wild uh, things that's not of God in people that don't know God and have not been enlightened on the full gospel, but folks been enlightened, we, we shouldn't have to contend with these things among them. Amen. I see a few nods and hear some blessing Jesus is. Praise the Lord. But I asked this young man, I, cause I thought maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just dead here, didn't pray right that morning. Maybe I'm just a dead dry hide and, and you ain't got no spirit in you. You just, you go to church and cross your legs and you just don't get in. I'm better than them and I'm just not going to get in. Well, it wouldn't that. I said, maybe... Maybe so. I'm always allowing that I might be the one that's wrong. I said, brother, I knew he's a good boy and loved the Lord. And I said, brother, did you feel the Lord the other night over there? He said, every now and then. Well, I could identify that every now and then I did. I know the Lord's with us everywhere we go, but when there's opposing forces, it's just hard to make the division and feel comfortable with it. <laughs> Personal gratification in the name of worship is a crack in the dam. Another crack in the dam is a lack of fear and respect unto the complete counsel of God through obedience. All of this in this narrative didn't deal with all of this, but the bottom line is this church wasn't. Fearing God and respecting God and the counsel of His Word, or they would not have been puffed up and acting as though nothing was wrong. That's where the church of our hour can get, if they're not careful, is to pretend that nothing is going wrong. We must recognize wrong and fix it. 
And on a personal basis, many times, that's where it's going to be fixed. Lack of fear and respect unto the complete counsel of God. The complete Word of God through obedience. Paul told Timothy, he said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. Not my favorite passages and leaving your favorite ones out. All Scripture is given. Who gave it? God Almighty gave it. By inspiration of God and is profitable. That means I can gain from it. For reproof, for doctrine, teaching me how to live, teaching me something to believe. For reproof, don't do that. For correction, change the way you do it. For instruction, this is the way to do it. In righteousness, this is God's way. Here's some examples. Ephesians 6 and 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Colossians 3 and 20, children, obey your parents in the, all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Children with a problem of obeying their parents have a hard time convincing me that they love the Lord. They have a hard time convincing me that their shout was an original shout prompted by the Holy Ghost. Sound like you're hard on children. Young folks, I want to be hard on sin. I want to be hard on the crack in the wall that's going to cause a flood after a while. He said, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Masters in this text could be the same as we would call employer. Not with our service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. The Christian, how many bosses is in the house? Ladies, don't raise your hand. How many has a leadership position on the job? Just one? You got anybody working for you? Or are you just working on your own? You got folks working for you? Your best employees are those that sold out for Christ, aren't they? The best employees for an employer is a man or woman that's completely sold out for Christ. Why? Because they obey in all things their masters, their employers, according to the Not with eye service just to make them think good. Not just to please men, but in singleness of heart. Whatsoever you do, do as unto the Lord. That's the reason I had a problem when, when the Lord's dealing with me to resign my position as a uh, manager or supervisor because I was trying to be the best supervisor I could be. That's what God expected me to be. And then at the same time, I, I was trying to be the best pastor I could be. That's what God expected me to be. But God was dealing with my heart to let go of some of that stress uh, 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 that was on me that was hindering the work of God that I was trying to do. And I asked a man in a seminar, I said, Sir, I said, he's, preach, he's teaching on priorities. I said, Sir, what if you got two of them? Trying to be the best pastor. I was trying to be the best supervisor. He said, I'm sorry, but you can't have but one. I thought, you're not a man of God, but you just preached something to me. Right. It wasn't long. I was calling my boss and, and talking to him about what God wanted me to do. Praise the Lord. I warned them when I interviewed that we had to all reapply for a job because they were switching up in the company and, 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 and just they was cutting heads. Y'all know what that means. They were saving money, and we had to reapply. And and, the, and I told them when I reapplied, I, I'm preaching. I don't know how long I'm going to be with you. God's dealing with me. But they hired me, kept me on, and promoted me anyway. And that was a sign to hang on there. It wasn't a sign when I just couldn't hardly live with myself knowing I was needing to do something else. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But the spirit of obedience made me want to be the best employee that they had 
The spirit of obedience will make you want to be the best Christian that walks on the property of your county that you live in. The spirit of fear and respect for the complete Word of God will make you desire to be the best at whatever you do. If you are the church cleaner tonight, you'll want to clean it like it's spring cleaning if you're able every time. I don't know who cleans the church. I'm not wanting to know. Amen, but praise God, I'm going to dust the organ tonight. Ah, I'm in a hurry. And here you go. Is that the way you'd want the Lord to deal with you when you have a headache and God just brushed by part of your headache? Oh, you'd want God to polish that head inside with all the soothing that He possibly can. I'm having a good time. I hope y'all are. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Put them in mind. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. The crack in the dam comes when a lack of fear respect to the whole counsel of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. He said, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. A magistrate is a public civil officer. That's a governor. That's a policeman. That's a mayor. That's a stop sign. That's a 55 mile an hour sign. That's a 35 mile an hour sign. I wasn't paying attention. My wife says 35. And I was deep in thought. And she had to tell me again. But when you recognize that you're subject to the principality, to the magistrate, it's laughed off so many times. But it's a crack in the wall. You'll hear me tonight. We poke fun about these kind of things. But it's really a crack in the wall. Because you witness to that trooper that stops you for speeding when you did it on purpose. I said when you did it and you knew better, you wasn't just infatuated with vault and all and wasn't realizing it because you could tell him that officer, I didn't realize what I was doing, but you knew. You wasn't going to the emergency room. You wasn't running late for your medicine. You was just running because you like it. We laugh it off. We poke fun at it. But it's the Word of God. I said it's the Word of God. To obey them that help. To obey magistrates. To be ready to every good work. You witness to that officer when you say, well, sir, I knew it was what it was, but I just didn't want to do it. But Jesus loves you. And he said, right. And that's the Jesus I want, the kind that lives in you. (laughs) Praise the Lord. It don't squirm too much unless you're ready to pray. (laughs) Praise the Lord. God's real. I'm preaching about a crack in the wall. Cracks are very small things. Very small things. There's people have cracked the bone and didn't know it. How many's ever done that? You cracked the bone and you didn't know it, but when you went to use that arm, you knew something ain't right. I think I got a cracked bone somewhere up in there right now. Because if I do like that with this arm, ooh, something's wrong. And odds are, if it is cracked, I don't know if it'd be cracked, I don't know what's going on up there, but if it is and it's not fixed, it's going to get worse and worse. And if y'all happen to hear that Brother Morgan's having a rotor cup uh, replacement or something in his shoulder, you remember tonight, I told it it was a small thing, it don't bother me, except when I do that, so I just don't do that. But after a while, when I go to doing something in the yard, I'm going to have to do that somewhere or another. And if it is, it's going to show up. And it's going to be a flood of pain. But if I'd only just go ahead and have it fixed. If 
but I don't know that it's wrong. And that's where we're at tonight in most cases. We're not convinced that it is a crack, so we don't do nothing about it until we start seeing the water rise up to the first step of the house. And then we start getting on the horn and saying something's got to be done. Call the mayor. Call the the, the civil defense group. Call them. It's too late. They told you we needed funds to fix the crack in the wall. I don't know if it's true, but they say that that uh, uh, explosion in the Gulf in the oil, with the oil deal, I read somewhere where they said that they knew there was a problem. And they contacted authorities and said, we need help with this problem. But it was ignored, if I remember the story right. So it was ignored, but look what's happened. And now they're being blamed for it, not the authorities. You and I are the authorities of whatever little crack is in our spiritual walk. Whatever cracks in our spiritual wall tonight, we're the authorities. Hebrews 13 and 17 said, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you that you'd have to be instructed with grief over and over and over again. Peter said, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Overheard a woman in a convenience store speaking to another woman that was complaining about the heat. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And one of them had very long hair, and she said her husband likes it. And she said that scoundrel ought to have to deal with it, or something like that. But the other one made the comment, my husband said I never cut my hair, and that's, and I just went and whacked it off. Well, she basically said, I could care less at what my husband wanted. Now, that was to be expected in the world. But wives that don't understand the submissiveness to their Christian husband, there's a crack in the wall. What do we do? We fix the crack. Paul said in verse number 12 and 13, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. What he's saying is that that's causing a little leaven that's going to spoil the whole lump. He said, fix it. Remove the problem. Remove the problem. Would you stand tonight?